Okay. Hello? Okay. Good afternoon. We're going to get started because um, I've been spending a couple days with Craig and Goodness, and Joni has spent a long time with them over the last week, and they have great stories and lots to tell. Um, for those of you that don't know, we have been in partnership with the Black Mambas for about three years now. Um, we've supported some pickets um, or kind of shelters for the Black Mambas out in the bush. And um, with the great support of the Shoemaker Family Foundation, they have also come through the Kansas City Zoo in support of the Black Mambas. We were able to support some Black Mamba training as well as their bush baby program and a lot of equipment and needs they needed for that. So we are very grateful for that and the continued partnership with them and the Black Mambas. But I'm going to let Joni, um, who just got back from South Africa on Sunday, uh, let you know what's going on with uh, Craig and Goodness. Good afternoon. As Stacia said, we just returned, so we're all a little bit jet lagged, so please forgive us if we're a little incoherent at times. Um, but I do want to introduce you to, this is Craig Spencer. He is the director of Transfrontier Africa, and that is the parent organization sort of of the Black Mambas. I think Craig saw a need there for, for a little more intensive interaction to do a rhino anti-poaching, so he founded this group of all women anti-poaching unit. Um, so he is the creator of the Black Mambas unit. I had the pleasure of writing with goodness. I would try to pronounce your name, but I would probably get your last name wrong. Malangwa? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, so I had the pleasure of riding with her on patrols and walking. We, we did a walk first thing in the morning from 6 to 9 a.m. And then we went out again uh, in the evening in a vehicle from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. And uh, so she is the feet's on the ground, boots on the ground. Um, I give them a lot of credit, a lot of respect. They're out there regardless of the weather, and they're doing a great job. So with that, I'll let you guys take it over. I don't want to steal all your thunder. I think it's on, not yet, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Joni. That was awesome. Um, and this is such a fantastic venue. I've, we don't do a lot of this sort of public presenting, but when we do, it's normally in a dodgy location in somebody's garage or in a pet store in town. And say, you know, we do bingo evenings to raise money and all sorts of things. So this is really fantastic. It's such a privilege for us to be here as well. Uh, Sergeant Goodness Mklanga, my colleague, the second intake of the Black Mambas, first time she's traveled abroad, first time on an airplane as well. Yeah. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for us, and particularly the Black Mambas, to, to make them global, to bring them into the global community, show them that life does exist outside the, the bush, you know, so lions and things. Let's kick off with the presentation. I will do the first few slides, and I'm going to hand over to Goodness as well. Luckily, there's a little screen down here, so I don't have to break my neck to turn around Check that thing out all the time. Okay, so Black Mamba Anti-Poaching Unit, it's all women. Uh, Transfrontier Africa, like I said, is a non-profit uh, NGO. We have a number of different legs. Uh, there'll be all pillars that we stand on, silos, however you want to uh, describe it. The one is the, the animal rescue, which is flying around, darting animals, removing snares, fixing them up, uh, fixing up bullet wounds, rescuing them when they walk into mines. As we speak now, uh, one of the Black Mamba units is tracking a bull elephant with a snare around its foot. We've got the message on the way in. Terrible photograph. It's cut in quite deeply. Uh, but we'll, if we catch up with it, we'll put a plane up, we'll locate the Mambas, we'll do the groundwork, and our vet will we'll sort it out. That's a, a, you know, so the, what I want you guys to understand is that you know, to walk around and protect animals from poachers is not the, the be-all and the end-all. You know, there's a number of ingredients into the cake of wildlife conservation. And, uh, you know, everybody has a very important role to play. Uh, animal rescue is one of them. It prevents human wildlife conflict as well, so you're actually buying sympathy for that species. Um, and then we've got the research component. We have a research facility on the camp that Joni probably spent some time at as well, uh, where we have a lot of collaborations with universities from Hawaii to uh, Western Kentucky and Arizona and the South African universities, a lot of PhDs and things going on there. And then the wildlife security which includes the Black Mamba operation. Our partners, okay, now you know basically what we do. I just sit around drinking a lot of rum. Uh, they do all the work. 
and I had my hair cut for the first time. So if my mother ever, ever watches this, she's been harassing me for a long time to get my hair cut. Um, all right, so these are partners. That's the Black Mamba logo. I don't think there's a point on here. Black Mamba logo is very cool. Bush Babies is our environmental education component, which falls under the, the Black Mamba thing. And then Pondoro Game Lodge needs a special mention. They're a very high-end lodge uh, on the landscape, and they buy into the Black Mamba program and keep us going with donations from time to time. They have some merchandise in their little curio shop there and so on. Uh, we're on their website, and uh, you know it's, it's fantastic for us to be able to partner with uh, some of the commercial industries. Then, of course, we are legitimized by uh, receiving 30% of our funding from the national government of South Africa because they recognize the value of the project. And a lot of NGOs out there raising money and la, 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 but they don't have that stability and they don't have um, a legitimate mandate to operate. We're very proud to say that we actually have a mandate. You know, it's a, it's a contract, it's an MOU, and the government gives us as much as they possibly can. I was going to say something, but this is going to end up on YouTube. So thank you to the South African, we're very grateful. You know where I live as well, so that's a good thing. Where do we fit in on the landscape? Um, that's the Kruger National Park to the east, Mozambique. To the north, Zimbabwe, and the south is Swaziland. We didn't put it on because it's very small. And that light green area is what we call the Association of Private Reserves. It's old farmland that has been brought into the Kruger to make it um, wider on the east-west axis. It's about 430 kilometers from north to south. We are sitting there, that little Baluli sign. That's where the Black Mamas are. 146 kilometers of fence line are patrolled every day and night by the Mamas. What's that? Are you scratching your nose? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on X and Y, I'm just going to whiz through this. This is how our wildlife security model is put together. Black mambas are the bobbies on the beat. You can see on the, on the horizontal axis, on the X axis, they're the boots on the ground. They cover a lot of kilometers, a lot of hectares, a lot of ground. They're on the public interface. Everybody sees them, they're at roadblocks, they're walking up and down the boundaries, they're in the communities, in the schools, etc. Um, and then the, the level of sort of risk or threat is quite low, but they're covering a much bigger area. The information gatherers, their eyes and ears, they're my little bobbies on the beat. The next level above that is the, the tactical response teams. So every Black Mamba unit that's deployed has got backup. Uh, and then the strategic deployment. Um, Joni, you were at our ops room, eh? Okay, so we have a, a, a quite a high-tech operations room. Everybody's tracked and tagged. And then we have the intelligence network. So this is an intelligence-driven operation. Nobody can poach a rhino unless they have somebody on the inside that's assisting them. We can't catch a poacher unless we have somebody on the inside assisting us. So, you know, it's an intelligence-driven industry, rhino poaching. So we're both on both sides. There's nothing dirtier than an informant, but we need them. Okay, and there's that little badge just to say thanks again. Okay, so the Black Mambas, that's a nice little um, saying. I'm, I'm going to read it off. But the, 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 oh, you guys can read it for yourselves, I'm sure. It's like in font two down here, but I think you can probably see the, the text there. Um, that's our second intake of Mambas. Are you in this picture? No. Goodness, why no. did you take the picture? <laughs> <laughs> So they won this award from, from UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, 2015 Champions of the Earth. It's probably the highest accolade that you can give to a, a conservation body. Uh, we're very proud. The Mambas went over to New York City and they received it uh, on behalf of their colleagues and so on. And that's just purely because they're the eyes and the ears, the data gatherers, the intelligence gatherers, build into a predictive model of where the poachers are going to operate and when. Okay. These are just Google images. I can't show images from our landscape because I get into trouble, unfortunately. It's a, a paramilitary government controlled thing. So you'll find these pictures anywhere on the Google machine. Um, so what's the mission of the Black Mambas? It's to make the Great Kruger National Park the most difficult, undesirable, and the riskiest place to poach. Okay, we're not there to create orphans and widows and, and drive people out in body bags. You're just going to create polarization between the local community, there, but we will disrupt that landscape. Okay, and then we also want to create a proud and sympathetic, I call it environmental patriotism, okay, uh, in the communities. I want the people to be proud 
of what it is. What's going on here, goodness? What is this? Who are we? We are the group of young women who operate under Balule Nature Reserve. Uh, we are the group of 33 young women, and we, link, we live alongside our reserve. 14, 14 young rural African women, 14 sisters, mothers, aunties, wives, and future grandmothers. We are the teachers and leaders, proud to defend us of our wildlife treasures. Uh, we started uh, this in 2013, but I came in 2014 to join uh, the group of the Black Mambas. Uh, what we do is that we patrol uh, the boundaries of the uh, Baluli. We do the snare sweeping, we do uh, night patrols, and we also do uh, roadblocks. Okay, so goodness, thank you very much. That was fascinating. What, what's happening in the slide over here? Into that picture, uh, it was the first members who went training. So I was, I am not there into that picture. So these are the members who uh, go to the training. Uh, it was, uh, it was, we were divided into two groups. So this is the first group who went uh, training. So there they were busy doing uh, physical trainings, how to help each other. As you can see that they are holding hands from uh, each other. Uh, we do uh, things like we hold hand uh, for each other so that we can do things together. Okay, so so uh, let me help you out there a little bit. The, the training was uh, paramilitary. It's the same training that the guys go through. It's a military training camp. Uh, we use the, the same sergeants that we use, the drill sergeants, etc. The course is exactly the same. That's, that's, a, um, that's a pretty difficult exercise, that, to balance on those poles. You fall, you hurt yourself. So uh, what goodness was saying is that it's about um, the building uh, relationships with your people, you know, trust and, and whatever, that they must help you and guide you through. Um, what was the worst part of the training for you? Uh, sleeping into the bush uh, without getting proper food. Imagine spending uh, 13 days into the bush, uh, sleeping uh, on top of, of the rocks. You, have to, you don't have to bath. You have to do, uh, you have to run uh, about five kilometers a day. Uh, also, we have to is that I forget. We have to wake up earlier in the morning at around four o'clock. By six o'clock, we should have finished cooking. No sign of fire there, so that we start a normal a training. Yeah, it's quite. Um, so the, the training comprises of quite a lot of physical stuff. Okay, it's a typical basic training kind of thing. Uh, a lot of physical, a lot of survival skills, a lot of living and and interacting and becoming familiar with the wild animals. On the landscape, uh, you're getting your water out of the same places where the animals poop and swim and dribble in and various other things. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. yeah That's right. where you had to get your water. Thank you very much. You know, and uh, it's the living off the land and survival, building your own shelters and what have you. And then there's also a lot of contact learning time with arrest procedures, criminal procedures, court procedures, search and seizure procedures. You know how to fill in dockets at the police station and everything. So the training is quite a, quite a mission. I'm very proud to say that nobody in the Mambas, if you were selected for the training, nobody fell off the course. We only had um, any who hurt her ankle right at the end, and she sat in the operations room. But nobody dropped off the course, which is cool. With the men, you get a lot of dropouts from the men. Yeah. <laughs> the, the young guys, they go there, they say, oh, an, you can't talk to me like that. You know, do you know who my dad is? You can't talk to me like that. Bah. What? Uh, so I'll just, this is a bit boring, so I'll just whiz through it quickly. What do we do? Reducing bushmeat poaching. Okay. How do we do that? The bushmeat poachers, what's that all about? Uh, bushmeat poaching is where people go to the reserve. They put snares into the reserve. Uh, the, a snares is a piece of wire that they use to set uh, into the bush and trap the animals so that they will get meat. Just have a look at that bottom picture. To me, it's bottom right. To you, it's probably also bottom right then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on. It's like a mirror image kind of thing. Here. Okay, can you explain to us what's going on in each of these pictures, goodness? Which picture? I'm confused, you know. What's, what's this 
looks like Everjoy crouching down here and pointing at a big hole. The lady who's uh, on the fence line there, uh, as you can see, there's a little bit of hole into that fence. So whenever we go on a foot patrol in the morning, we check for the holes on the fence. We make sure that we close those holes and because uh, wild animals will come out of the reserve. So we're trying to prevent that. Besides animals, people can crawl under that fence line and get inside the reserve and do the poaching. Uh, so when we do our morning patrols, we do uh, take some branches and put it on the fence line so that animals don't uh, go out. And if we find that there are uh, poachers tracks, we report it to the ops room so the, uh, the armed response, armed response team, yeah. take up, took it from there. So the standard operational procedures, obviously early detection is what saves lives and prevents human wildlife conflict. If a lion had dug under there or a, or a pack of wild dogs, which is a critically endangered species, as you guys know, okay, we need to know about it immediately. That's why the Mamba's patrols start at the crack of dawn and again in the evening when the sun sets. Animals are out, we need to get them back in. It's a three million hectare landscape. We only have a fence on the western side and the local community is pretty damn close and it's cattle farming and maize farming and la 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 la. So just to put it into perspective, last year we had a, a, a we were at the pinnacle of a three-year drought, four-year drought, because it hasn't quite broken yet. And in that time, we were dealing with, do you remember on your nighttime patrols, how many times were elephants getting out on that northern section of that fence? Two or three times a night? Yeah. Every night. We brought them all back. Every single one. Sometimes it's with helicopters, trucks, cranes, building roads to get into places, to move the, the I mean, it's like literally cranes to pick them up and stick them on the back of flatbed trucks. We had to be very inventive. We brought back rhinos back, swinging them under helicopters. I actually wear a necklace because we were the first to, to ever do that. And they made me a little silver pendant of a rhino hanging upside down by his feet. Because everybody said, yeah, his head will fall off. And it's, it's not made out of paper. It's not a Land Rover. You know? And we consulted the veterinarian. It's quite a long process. And to get a chopper that, heavy enough to bring these things back in. Anyway, worked out. Now everybody does it. Now it's the, the latest technique in moving black rhinos around. Anyway, so early detection is critical. To save animals, it's not just about keeping people out, it's also about keeping them in. And as much as we would like them to be able to range freely, they're not safe out there. They're safe inside. They've got three million hectares. Why do they want to go there anyway? <laughs> so what's happening in the bottom over there? Is that Yentekile uh, with the radio to it? Yeah. Yeah. That's obviously a nighttime patrol, right? Yeah. Uh, patrolling the reserve. We do night patrol where we drive around with vehicles. We use the spotlight to shine around. Uh, by doing that, we believe that poachers, they don't want to be seen. So by doing that, uh, we believe that poachers will not come uh, near us. And we try to scare them away. We're not trying to, to kill anybody because that's why we don't carry guns. So by doing that, uh, poachers, we disturb them by doing their work inside the reserve. And we also do a observation post. Observation post is where we stop the car after driving around. We listen anything that we can hear inside the reserve, like voices of people talking. We report uh, into the ops room. We also report uh, some lights where we can notice inside inside the bushes. We know that uh, people are sleeping by that time. Only the members and other people had, would do their patrol. So we report side things. And we also listen to the gunshots because uh, by that time, even immediately we hear the gunshots, we report it to the ops room because it might happen that uh, there are poachers that are uh, shooting around. So just have a look at... at um I'm, I'm going to switch because we're taking too long on the slides. Oh, goodness, we must speed it up a bit. So just talk on the actual picture. Okay. Okay, because there will be a picture about the other things that you've mentioned now in the meantime. But what goodness was saying is basically crime prevention. Our job is to keep the animals alive. Okay, our job is not to catch poachers and to create animosity in the local community. Our job is to protect the wild life. The, the, the plight of the rhinos, uh, 2012, when, they, when the poaching started, uh, you know, we woke up one day and we just had carcasses lying on the landscape. You know, I've been in this industry for how long now? 24 years. And, you know, the last rhino poaching scourge was in the late 80s, early 90s. Then it went away and we forgot all about it. And then we thought, you know what, we're not going to shoot this problem off the landscape again. We're going to have to come up with something new. So hence the, 
the Black Mamba model, and it's been a lot more because we need a long-term investment. We need to, to have a, a community with patriotic feelings towards the wildlife and the national park. If they only see us as a paramilitary unit that is shooting at them every time they come in, it's going to create this divide. Okay, two different sets of values are going to form. And it's what we call social decay or moral decay. There is a false economy, obviously, because the rhinos will run out eventually, which means they will have to target something else. And already the, the target has moved to elephant ivory, which was predictable, and lions for the lion bones. I mean, it's bizarre sometimes what the people eat over there. It's uh, everybody says, oh, no, what are you going to do about the black market? It's not a black market, people. That's a yellow market. Okay, and you can put that on your YouTube because that's it, it is everything is going to Asia, to Vietnam, and to China. Okay, and that is a reality. Uh, it, and you know, everybody puts their foots around and says, "Oh, you can't say that. You can't say it. Why not? Because it's true. You know, the figures and the facts are out there. Those are the consumptive nations of the endangered species of Africa and in other parts of the world as well. So let's not put your foot around. Let's say it like it is. Okay. Now, having said that, social decay. So you think of a poacher group coming into the landscape. It's three people plus a driver, so four. So he gets dropped off with a car, then three people are running on foot in the bush. One's got a gun, the other one's carrying a bag with an axe and what have you, and the other guy's a guide. Probably a field ranger that's off duty, somebody from a lodge, or what have you, that's sitting at home, getting paid a lot of money to lead them in and take them to where the rhinos are. Okay, so that's three guys, one gun, po po pocket full of bullets. Homemade silencer, normally out of a shock absorber of a car, stuffed with steel wool or an old mag light, you know, those, those metal torches. The cops use quite a lot. They knock the insides out, fill it up with steel wool, stick it on, compromises the weapon's integrity and its accuracy and its velocity and all sorts of things. Why do they put these silencers on their guns? They also put sponge under their shoes. They come in at night time. Why? I, I, sorry, it's not, it's not a lecture. It's not a classroom. I'll tell you why. <laughs> 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 There'll be a test on Friday. I'll tell you why. It's because they don't want to be detected. Exactly what Goodness said earlier. Their main mission is to get in and out without being detected. Okay, that's why they don't use axes and chainsaws as often. Well, they don't use chainsaws at all anymore because they make too much noise. And the mumbas pick up on that noise. Standard operational procedure. They have a device. They're pointed. It tells them exactly how far the noise is and, and what the vector is, the direction, whatever it might be. It goes straight to the operations room, digital, draws a line on the map, boom, arm response pinpoints and heads to that direction. They must get in, and they must get out undetected, and it's a snatch and grab operation. Before the Black Mamba project started, they had free access to that landscape 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Some of those bushmeat camps and whatever that you guys found, you could see the people that had been camping there for weeks. They were living on the reserve, harvesting wildlife at the industrial level. And the ash in those fire pits was up to here. Yeah, so that's every night building fire, happy days, happy days. Since the Black Mambas, the morning, the evening patrols, we've displaced them spatially on the landscape and also temporarily over time. So whereas they used to poach in optimum times, now we're forcing them to poach on the darkest nights in four hours, snatch and grab stuff. And we've got a whole lot of different techniques and we've done a lot of research. And, you know, the, the rhinos that are attracted to certain water holes, we close them down to pull the rhinos deeper into the park, which gives us more depth, as we call it. So when the Mambas detect the tracks, we know we've got 20 kilometers to track this guy and to catch up with him rather than two or three kilometers, if you understand what I mean. So depth is critical to us as well. Uh, and sometimes if we don't know where they are, it's too dangerous, we'll just pin them down and wait for sunrise, and then I can put a chopper up. We can't fly out there at nighttime, unfortunately. We don't have nighttime capabilities. Okay, what's this? A little cartoon. Fascinating. The pictures. This was your intake, am I right? Mm, no. Not. <laughs> oh, you don't know what's going on around here anymore. That's what the Mambas look like. That's now after consultation with the, um, the tribal authorities. We call them CPAs there, the Community Property Association. It's basically the, the tribal council. And we will ask them, do they approve? This is what we expect of the girls. Can you please advertise? Let us know when you found us some candidates. Uh, and they do. They're very good. And they arrive. I wish this thing had a pointer. And they stand there in their best clothes. And they want a job. Because guess what? If I said to you, I want you to climb on top of this airplane and cling to it all the way to China and back, you would do it because you needed the job so badly. Am I right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the people, 
10%. This is the only one. Okay. Apply for it because they need the job. Unemployment in South Africa is horrendous. Okay. You can't eat sand and air. You need a job. That's why I'm so proud of the fact, and you know, a lot of the time at the interview, when you ask the people, oh, you know, it's very physical, and what do you mean? They say, oh, I don't think I can cope with the physical exercise. Say, Excuse me, let me just put a few things into perspective. It's 46 degrees Celsius outside. You're going to go and collect water in a 20 liter bucket and stick it on your head. Then you're going to carry a baby on your back, two bundles of, of firewood, and another bucket of water here, and a bag of grain. You know, so you've got like 100 kilograms balanced on you in this heat walking five kilometers backwards and forwards, and you tell me that you're not gonna make the physical training. I beg to differ, okay? You're already fit, you're already strong. It's going to happen. And I've, I've never been proven wrong. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, would you like to say something, goodness? What's happening? This is all part of the training. That's your special weapons training down there. That's your PWET group. And there's the marching, and then the, the, the PT. You've already been issued with uniforms there. Were you not in Sapiwe's intake? No, I was on the second intake. Yeah, <laughs> but that was Sapiwe's intake. There's an example of uh, one of the homemade weapons with a homemade silencer. With the handle, you'll recognize the handle comes from a drill or an angle grinder or something. The rest of the weapons held together with uh, car tubing that's been stripped down into strips and wound around to keep the thing together. It's a 375. It's basically throwing out a piece of lead the size of a small Volkswagen Combi, you know, like a, a little beetle out the barrel. It's a very dangerous weapon to use, but they killed six rhinos with that before it was detected at a roadblock. What's happening there? Goodness. Uh, down there, it, I was there. You won't notice me, but I was there. We're doing a roadblock. Uh, we search vehicles that are coming in and outside the reserve. Uh, what do we search? We search a uh, uh, if people have unlicensed firearm, we took them away, we report to the police station. Uh, if they have bush meat when they are coming out, it is not allowed to have meat uh, without a permit. When they have uh, pangas, that will destroy inside the bushes. What's a panga? What's another name? For, it's a machete. You guys will know it as a machete, yeah. Okay. Oh, you disturb me. And we also searched for a rhino horns. Uh, it is not allowed to get outside the reserve with a rhino horns. So we make sure that when we do roadblocks, we search all these things that are illegal to take outside the reserve. So we do it uh, when uh, the contractors come in uh, on Monday, and we do it also on Friday because the contractors, they are going out a home, so we make sure that we search those people that they dis they don't destroy our reserve. Okay, very good. Now, the, so the the members are based on a number of pickets. We call them pickets. It's an old-fashioned military word, but it's basically like a, a little overnight facility for them. Um, we the, the statistics on these slides are a little bit out. Unfortunately, I didn't check them uh, because we had five member pickets. All right on the Baluli landscape. The one has just closed down. We've moved them a little bit further north. Electricity, water, you know, you need to wash, you need to go to the toilet, you need to keep your uniforms clean, you need to charge your radio batteries, etc., etc. You're operating from there. Uh, you know, so we want to make it a comfortable living environment. We want the people to struggle. That's the Hriki picket, we call it. So we're always asking for donations and the uh, Kansas City Zoo has been very kind to us with a lot of support over the last three years, and a lot of the money has gone into pickets uh, to build a proper facility in a strategic location where the people can operate from. Otherwise, you I mean, it's hot out there, and you're starting it early. You need a nice place to sleep. You, you know, human dignity is a critical thing, and some of them are dodgy still because they need quite a lot of money. Normally, we'll try and find an old building, like an old pump house from an old farm or whatever, and we even used an old aeroplane hangar. That's where goodness has been staying for how many years now? Three years, eh? The airplane hangar. Four years. So yeah, slowly, slowly. There we go. What's cooking there? That's Ebert Boy and? No, Tolile and Blazda. There we go. Daily food patrols on boundaries. As you can see, those two ladies there, they were 
up earlier in the morning, they were going to the patrol. I don't know what were they going to do, but we do uh, different patrols in the morning, which is fence patrol and snare sweeping. So these ladies were ready to do their patrols. What is the likelihood? I mean, what, what, what kind of animals live in that area? Which area? There where they are. Oh. The, the, the little shack that you see behind those ladies is where they are staying. Uh, it's the cricket team uh, that are staying there. It's very bad. If, it, if you can see that uh, area, it's not interesting. Nobody will want to, see, to stay there. It's, not, it's very, very bad. So they stay there every day, 21 days into the bush and, 20, and 10 days off. Okay, so, That's how we live. so when they go out on patrol like that, they're going to bump into elephants, buffaloes, lions, cheetahs, leopards. When, I mean, you guys that are, are operating uh, hands-on in the zoo know when your animals are active. Ironically, that's when the mambas have to patrol as well. You know, if you go to Africa on a game drive or on a safari, you know, they wake you up early in the morning because that's those crepuscular times of the day or when the animals are the most active. But that's when we have to patrol. So the likelihood, I mean, it's, it's every day and every night you're, going, you're getting a game drive or a game walk on foot patrol or on your vehicles eh, when you're patrolling. It's, uh, it's fascinating. Okay. Vehicle night, vehicle patrols at night. That is what I was explaining. There is the Land Rover that uh, we use on patrol. Is the Hurricane Land Rovers. Their members there, they were busy shining around, uh, see if they can find anything suspicious into the bushes. Uh, I think they were doing OP, the observation post, where they look and listen for anything that they can hear in, uh, inside the reserve. Yeah, it's important for us not to sneak around, okay? There's a lot of uh, science behind what we do. We have wildlife crime analysts, criminologists. We have collaborations with uh, the Institutes of Crime and Law Enforcement that analyze all of our data and whatever as well. And I'll give you an example. You're driving along. You see what looks like an official vehicle, like a cop car or something. Immediately your heart rate goes up, your endocrine system kicks in, you look at your speed, you think mentally, where's my driver's license, ETC, and like try not to be observed, you know. <laughs> just nothing to see here, just blending in, you know. And that's the impact of a visual. We have evolved under a law enforcement kind of top-down approach, you know, from th for thousands and thousands of years. So when you, even in, in the United Kingdom now, because they have a shortage of bobbies, of policemen, they have cardboard cutouts of them in some shops because you walk in and it takes a split second for your mind to click that that's actually a cardboard cutout but in that time your heart rate's increased you know all those those uh, adrenaline is rushing and everything you think okay i'm not going to pinch that little hamburger thing or whatever so visual policing for us is critical we don't want our members sneaking around in the bush and pouncing out you know surprise we want the poachers to be aware that the mambas are there and say, damn it, it's not worth our while. They will see us. So let's get out of here. You'll notice in that picture, full moon. That's when the poachers would like to poach because if they use torches, they expose themselves. They'll be seen. So they wait for the full moon and they come in. But that's why we are all over the show. Okay, there's that same picture. We don't have to say anything about that because we've said it all before. Now, this is a new thing. Uh, part of the evolution of the Black Mamba program was to develop the canine component. We've always had canine, but it's always been with me because I like my dogs and I've always had my Belgian Malinois and my one was eaten. He, he lost his leg and then he got spat in the face with a spinning cobra and he was this three-legged sort of um, like Frankenstein's monster dog, you know. But he was so smart. Remember Shia? No. Mm. He was my favorite dog, man. And then a crocodile ate him one day, Shane. Yeah, ship it. You know, I, I thought, you know, what else could I have? Like space debris is going to fall on this animal? You know, he was like literally... But I loved him to bits. And this, this is his collar, ironically, that we made into bracelets for me so I can keep him close. Now, canines are critical to us because we use them for a number of reasons, but primarily for detection work. 
So at a roadblock or at, at a building site or something, if we get a tip off, the poachers will try and hide a weapon or a horn or whatever it might be. And you can search until you blew the face. You won't find it, but the dog will. There you go. Dogs are trained in Germany. You actually use um, the Frankfurt Zoo, which is quite interesting, to down train the dogs from wild animals. So they just walk amongst the wild animals and they don't give a damn. You can just imagine taking a Belgian Malinois and it sees a mongoose run. It's going to chase that mongoose. There's nothing you can do to bring it back. But that's why part of the training of those dogs at the, um, the police academy, the Canine Peace Academy in Frankfurt, is to train them off animals. So you can walk amongst the elephants. They don't even notice. They don't even care. It's amazing. It's bizarre. Anyway, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, so um, we have 10 mambas trained up now. Very proud of them as well. They went to Jeva. It's, it's, a, it's a, lot of, <coughs> a lot of training. How long was Lile away for? It was like six months. Six, yeah. six, months. six months, yeah. Six months. six months training to get your DH5, your, your dog handle of fire. That's the, 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 the top of the range. She's now working at the Johannesburg International Airport with a detection dog. Very, very proud. We also have a canine unit at the orphanage, the, the endangered species center, where all of our lame, sick, and lazy animals end up, and the little orphaned rhinos when their mommies have been shot, because they, they, they're in a concentrated area and they're targets for the poachers. So we have a unit of black mambas, they walk with dogs. So dogs have got a visual uh, component to them. Okay, when you're patrolling with a dog, it looks more impressive. Okay, secondly, it's for detection work. And thirdly, it's to create a bond between the handler and the animal so that people can um, learn this connection with a dog. It's, I know it sounds bizarre, but in a lot of parts of the world, people uh, don't see animals as pets. And you can't ask somebody to empathize with an animal if you don't realize that it feels stresses as well. So that canine component, we also go into the communities on weekends uh, with an organization called Halo. I can't remember what it's called. Halo Angels. But uh, it's, it's to look after the, the domestic animals in the local tribal communities, Maseki in particular. So that's a uh, little Lisa and what have you. We have a vet nurse on our staff. So anyway, there it is. There's, oh, yay! Bullet! That's the that's Yenzi Kili with her dog. Bullet. One was poisoned quite recently. We think it was a, a cobra that bit the thing. It, it's a dangerous... Um, you know, dogs have got a pretty short lifespan. It's really hard because, you know, especially when you, you bond with the animal. It's a working dog. They're very special. And you end up bonding with the thing. And then it dies. You think, well, I'm never doing that again. Uh, but, yeah, that's a typical scene with the patrolling and whatever. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. Okay, I call this gateway crimes. But, oh, my goodness. Goodness? Mm -hmm. What's happening? What is that? Uh, down there is the bush kitchen where poachers used to uh, set their snares. They were staying there uh, before members go into that site and patrol. So they created a bush kitchen. As you can see, the meat has been uh, hanging there. So immediately we noticed that there is a site uh, next to the miner to, to, to the mining that people come across and do the uh, meat poaching and go out. So we decided to go there and try to do sweeping and see if we can, we can find anything. And that is what we have come across. We found a, they, were, they were relaxing, like it was their home. So we destroyed this uh, bush kitchen and we took the meat away and those people were arrested. You guys have heard of snares before, right? Okay, it's a, it's a classical wire trap. You can see a pile of it in the foreground. You can see some cable snares in the foreground there as well. It's a quite heavy duty snares that uh, will be used to catch a mega herbivore of some sorts. Now, the problem is that they're indiscriminate. So, you know, like old Johan, one of our managers, says the snare doesn't have a label on and says, I'm here to catch an impala. You know, anything that walks into that snare is going to be nabbed and will perish. Die. Even an elephant will walk into a thin piece of wire. This elephant, when we dart it now, you'll find that piece of wire is very thin. It's probably a piece of wire that was set for, for nothing more than a warthog or a small antelope. But the reality is the elephant stepped in it and it'll cut through the Achilles tendon. You know, it's a mega herbivore. It's, it's, it's gait. It needs to have three points of contact on the ground before it can lift another foot up. Once the one foot is compromised, it's immobile. It'll starve to death. Guaranteed. 
we lose elephants to thin pieces of wire. We lose more animals to snares than we do to poachers' bullets. And that is the reality in Africa. Everybody's so keen on the, on the militarized side of things. We've got guns and it's cool. You can jump out of helicopters with your dog strapped to your chest, you know, and underslung grenade launches at G.I. Jane and all that sort of thing. Guys, this is the wall of death. This is the gill net of the African bush, you know, because they get forgotten in there. They'll put a hundred and whatever snares out and walk away, and then the landscape is, is, is too hot for them. They won't come back. Five years later, those snares can catch a, a, a black rhino or a cheetah or a wild dog or whatever it is. It's the Mamba's single biggest coup. The one thing that... I think the Mambas should be praised for more than anything else is the fact that the bushmeat industry was brought to its knees in our area, in that whole district, because of the Mambas. They pulled the snares out. You know, just from walking around, they have a device where they record everything that's going, and it's in real time as well. So sitting in the operations room, it populates the aerial photograph of what's going on, and so we can see where the hotspots of the snares were. Hit those areas regularly. Break down the bush kitchen. This was number six, I think, eh? This bush kitchen. Mm. This was the sixth one, if I remember correctly. This was the one on Maseki. And uh, yeah, that's all, all that meat hanging up there and so on. They're gone. It's just not worth their while to, to fiddle around on that landscape anymore because they just know it's, it's a waste of their effort. So thank God for that. That's many animals saved. I can't count for the animals when they get out of our area. Like an elephant will walk 30 something clicks in a day, you know, and then it comes back wearing jewelry, we call it. Anything that leaves there is going to come back with wire earrings and necklaces, bangles like me. You know. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't know why that slide is in there. I put that in for, um, for the Interpol conference that I gave them a little talk. That's a cash in transit heist that happened. Now, we never used to have that kind of crime in our area. You know, there was never the only kind of crime you would ever find in our area were burglaries and wildlife crime, environmental crimes. Now, suddenly we started seeing cash and transit heists. ATMs were being blown up. People were hijacking cars, so on and so on and so on. And it was because the landscape had become so disrupted that the poachers weren't poaching rhinos anymore. They had to make their money somehow. Yeah, so they were using the same old tricks. And the nice thing about that, that was part of the plan, because the, you know, if you go to the magistrate and you say, I caught this person, and then my dog found this gun, and then two days later, we found this horn under this bush. You know, they're going to say, well, what are you trying to say? So he's a poacher. Really? They can prove it. You know, so it just clogs up the courts. It doesn't work out. We have very low conviction rate. There's an there's a element of Roman Dutch law that we have to prove. Mens rea, it's criminal intent. So somebody walking through the bush, you can't prove. The minute he hears a car coming or he hears the dogs, everything just gets flung and you've got a trespasser. Nothing more, nothing less. So to cut a long story short, push them out, force them to commit another crime somewhere else, something that the courts and the police actually know how to deal with. There's case law, there's a history, there's specialist legislation to deal with it. It's been very effective. Um, we do audit the effectiveness of the units all the time. There's a whole evaluation model that we use. And then we also have a polygraph, which is our honesty verification process. So lifestyle audits, polygraphs, sometimes we'll pull the cell phones in and audit those as well, because it's critical for us to be able to say that the black mambas are not crooked, because that's the first thing that somebody's going to say if you find a carcass. Or bush meat, they're going to say, oh, but I bet you the members took the horn. Or, you know, why was their car at, at the petrol station at midnight when they're supposed to be patrolling and what have you. Guys, these are the patrol orders. This is exactly where they were tracked in real time, etc. Here's their polygraph results. Here's their lifestyle audits. My people are clean. And we've removed a lot of people from the landscape. A lot that have failed those tests. Pangolin poachers, rhino poachers, people that are stealing from lodges, vast quantities of stock from the commercial lodges and what have you, but never once since the start of the Black Mambas has the Black Mamba failed the test. Nah, 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 nah. But, uh, you know. uh, so boring when I see all this writing. We are, we, are, um, we are trying to build the ethos of demilitarization because, uh, you know, to, to militarize your national parks is all good and well. 
And I don't say you can get away with it now. But the national parks have got a, you know, if I put it on a bar graph, the investment into the militarized units is up here. And the community involvement theme is down here. That's got a shift. I don't say you can ever do without a few guns on the landscape. But must all your resources go into that and create this massive rift and end up with a community full of orphans and widows on the one side of the tracks? And you're just going to have to put more and more money into your boundary fence to keep people out. And if we're going to build patriotism for our national parks, okay, then we are going to have to start ensuring that every iconic protected area has got a black mamba or something similar kind of theme going there. Remember, 50% of black mamba's job is at home. They're the primary caregivers in their community. They need to go and spread the word. And it's working about there. Okay, what's happening here, goodness? Who are these people? So under this uh, Black Mamba program, there is a Bush... <laughs> there is Bush Baby uh, program that has been formed uh, by... It is formed by the lady called Luwey Maifala. So he runs this uh, project. She goes to uh, 11 uh, local primary schools. She teaches children uh, about conservation. Uh, she makes sure that uh, children understand. And when you teach uh, young children, young minds, they do send the message to their parents and aunties, mummies, uh, and, some, uh, and everybody. So they understand more than uh, older people. So it's, it is better to, to, to teach children because their minds are still uh, young and fresh. So, and one day when they grow up, maybe they would like to do uh, this uh, mamba thing or they do uh, conservation work uh, to continue this uh, legacy of the black mambas to make sure that the uh, animals are protected into the reserve. So what that, that is what she's doing uh, into the primary schools. So the, the um, thanks goodness, the, the theme of the, I, I want to put things into perspective a little bit. You can't expect a teacher to go to work or anybody to go to work if the work environment is a misery. When the classroom is so hot, there's no chair for the teacher to sit on. It's just unpleasant. You know, you can't expect the, the children to come to school when the learning environment is a misery. Okay, so that was the first focus was to build resource centers and dolly up at least one classroom to make it a a safe and conducive teaching environment and learning environment. And then, of course, we have about 36 different lesson plans, structured lesson plans that have been approved by the Department of Education that have been integrated into the curricula at the schools. And the, the Black Mambas join. There's at any one time those kids are being, oh, my goodness, that's a lot of writing again. I really need to speak to Leonie about that. Okay, so there's a nice example of... The, if you look at the bottom left-hand side, that's one of the classrooms that is finished, being built up. It's got fans on the ceilings. It's got ceilings. No. It's, in fact, when Joni was there, you were, you were assisting with the, um, the building up of one of the classrooms, eh? the, the dollying up or whatever the word is. But weren't you painting it out? Did you manage to avoid that? You are so lucky. You are so, the fumes, you know, the taxi and you can't breathe for days. Like, and what have you, but no, cool. But you saw it, eh? it's a vast improvement. And then, and, and then what is this, what is this? Can you explain to us what's happening at the top and bottom there? Uh, there we were matching into the communities uh, with community members and school children. It was the World Elephant Day. Uh, so we're raising awareness about uh, elephant poaching, uh, including rhino poaching. So we were sending messages, a message to the rural communities uh, that they have, they have to stop uh, this poaching because they are destroying what we have and because uh, na nature is what we have and that they do not have to destroy what we have because it brings uh, people from outside and is our heritage. So with that that would, we we preventing uh, that they don't have to destroy it because uh, it's what we have and it brings money in our country. It's a, in the event of International Rhino and Elephant Day, the march for, uh, or the, around the world, they all do these marches against, I don't know what the hell they 
not against it, to be brutally honest with you, but there's a, and we participate in it somehow. But it's quite great that the, the mambas enthuse the communities, you know, and they all go marching down the streets, and it's just nice to engage. Now, you start off with a small group of mambas, and you look again, the entire community is behind you. And there's a lot of organizing, it's traffic control, and, uh, you know, little stations with water cans and things. It always gets into the media. All right, so that's what I was saying a little bit earlier. You can see from start to finish, it's really very hot inside those classrooms. And a lot of the kids, when they get there, they haven't eaten for a long time. They've had to walk. Uh, their shoes are broken if they've got shoes at all. So we have a small part of the program is to clothe the people dressed for success. Uh, and they get shoes and uniforms as often as we can afford it. All depends on the donations. And then, of course, the... Um, I know it sounds cliche to build vegetable gardens and what have you. Those tires, by the way, come from mining trucks. We have a lot of mines along the periphery of the park. The mines donate the tires to us, cut them open with an angle grinder, fill them up with soil. Because you've got to protect them against goats. There's no point in planting something like potatoes, etc. Because the goats are going to eat them when you're not watching. Okay, so you have to make a plan. But it's important that the children at the schools are not just learning academics, but also for food security, that they know how to grow their own things and look after things, not just the traditional old tomatoes and, and um, corn. Um, what's quite nice about this program is, you know, we've decided in, you know, to evaluate kids. We have an evaluation system. They write the typical exams and, you know, and they have their little score charts and all that sort of thing. But some kids are not academically strong, so they don't get the reward at the end of the year is to go on a big camp into the bush, take them on game drives and, and give them a whole big thing. And those are the, the high-end achievers. But if you attend the vegetable garden, the more hours you put in at the vegetable garden and the better your vegetable garden looks, the more points you get. So you can still get rewarded at the end of the year, even if you're not an academic achiever. Yeah, and you can still get to go and enjoy the bush. It's pretty cool. But the goats, people, the goats. <laughs> Yeah, lots of different subjects, precipitation, EDC. Okay, so remember, if you, if, you know, to, to measure behavioral change is probably one of the most difficult things ever. So a lot of NGOs are active in Africa with environmental education. The zoos have a huge environmental education uh, component as well. But how do you measure whether there's been behavioral change? It's really hard. It's really hard. But I promise you, it's critical. Okay, just because we can't quantify it doesn't mean we should be doing it. Okay, but... We have to integrate our programs into the national curricula. So we can't just walk into a classroom, take it over and start teaching them about bubblegum and fairies, you know, and unicorns and My Little Pony or something. You know, it's got to be part of the curricula. And then the bush camps. Have you attended one of the bush camps yet? Not yet. Not yet. It's pretty cool. Look at these smiley little faces. Guys, this is what it's actually all about. You know, saving rhinos, saving wildlife, and whatever. The cool part is flying with the helicopters and chasing around in the bush with cool guns and what have you, all right? That's cool. But guess what? That happens maybe once a month, okay? The rest of the time, those people are like firemen playing cards, waiting for the bell to ring. A good fireman is putting in fire breaks, servicing fire extinguishers, and teaching children how not to burn the house down when mommy's not watching, okay? Because that keeps those people playing cards upstairs so that they never have to slide down that pole. If you understand what I mean, do you like my little analogy? Me too. Somebody write it down. Okay. Now, the, <laughs> so that's what the Mambas are doing behind the scenes. They're making sure that the armed response team can sit upstairs and play cards and drink coffee all night because they're in the classrooms, they're in the public's face, spotlighting all over the show, preparing, preventing. I just love this part of the program. My favorite project is actually. Goodness me, goodness, that's cooking. That's your intake. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Explain. And into the top left, that is our intake. That was the very hardest training we ever did. Uh, and to the top, top right, we were doing a physical uh, training. It was a retraining. Uh, what that we did at uh, Maika Villages. Uh, believe me, this training, it was the hardest training, and I believe that this training has made me strong and uh, who I am today. Because if I didn't done this training, 
I shouldn't be doing this job because it's the hardest uh, job that we are doing uh, into the reserve. And people in our communities, they start to to get a uh, to get interested in what we do because they didn't believe that we could do it. In the beginning, they said, no, you're not going to do it. Uh, you will quit uh, along the way. By so that they see now that we are doing just fine and we are happy there. So they start uh, doing, like, they, they would like to join us, uh, most of the women. Even men were judging us that you can't do what men, uh, that was supposed to be done by men. So that makes me very proud because of that training we did, it was very hard and horrible. <laughs> you realize there's retraining again later this year. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's very unfortunate. Um, it, 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 everything costs money, you know. We, it, it, if, if we want to train somebody and have them registered to be able to operate in the security arena, you have to have accredited training and there's only a few facilities uh, that can do that. They need uh, first aid training, trauma first aid, special weapons training, blah, blah, blah driver's licenses, four by four training, and everything has to have a certificate, which means you've got to go to an academic environment, some college somewhere that offers that thing, will come and do it for you in the bush. And so it's, it's very expensive. We do as much of the training as we can in-house, but it is not certified. We're not a training academy. We don't have that anyway. So, so what's happening up here, uh, that's a traditional dancer. So that's the end of the, the training when the, the mamas are all pulled together. It's the three bridges. Journey, do you, do you recognize it? And the three bridges car park, Ulifan's River is just down the drag, and we celebrate. And there's a parade, and you know everybody gets awarded their uh, badges and what have you. Okay, a lot of physical stuff. The classrooms there again, you can see one of the mambas standing in the classrooms. And then at the bottom, another another rally. Okay, yay, let's go save the animals. Everybody jump on the bandwagon. We are the role models. Yes, we are the role models. Uh, because in the beginning when we started, like I said earlier, uh, it wasn't easy for us. Uh, everyone was doubting on us, looking down on us, uh, saying that you can't do this. So, but because we had passion on what we were doing, we meant what we were doing, and we believed that we could do this through hard work that we did. We managed to get to where we are today. So we are, we are the role models to young children, and we are the role models to our to, to young women who who's, uh, who are in the same age uh, like us, and even the people who are educated, they wish to be like us. And even though we tell them that you can't do this because it's the hardest thing, we do this because we want we want it for we do it for the living and to get uh, something and bring into our families. They say no, you are traveling overseas. You people have anything that you want. So I believe that we are the role models uh, because of the hard work that we do. We have pride and dignity. As you can see, we are uh, uh, four ladies there. We we are we we have pride and dignity or on what we are doing because people, a lot of people have recognized us because of the work that we do. So I I really I'm, I'm feeling very proud. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, because I'm standing here in front of you without any doubt that if you can go with uh, me into South Africa, you, you can see what we do. That is not a story. Uh, we mean what we do. We wake up earlier in the morning while people are still sleeping. We walk into the bushes, into the big fight, trying to protect uh, our animals. So we are proud of what we do. Thanks, goodness. Before you go on, I just want to point out that, that you know our equipment is old. We've had to make things up as we go along. We're not a, um, an affluent NGO. The, the money we get from the government goes straight into salaries for the black mambas on the ground. Then we must top them up. La, 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 la. So our, our oldest vehicle is a 1964 model Land Rover. And the most recent one, which is mine, which is standing derelict at the moment, ironically, the newest ones can't last, is a 2000 model. So our newest vehicle is, is already almost 20 years old. You know? And the, the terrain is harsh, the shock absorbers go, the suspension bushes, you know, engine mounting brackets, gearbox brackets, whatever. It's just an endless nightmare. But five units need five vehicles. And you need to have one on standby. And then you have to replenish them with food, gas, water pipes when the elephants pull them out, ETC. I'll just quickly whiz through because I can see we're being stalked here in the background. <laughs> we're about to get thrown out. I think we've taken up too much time. The Rhino Orphanage, uh, we do have an endangered species center where, uh, as I said earlier, lame, sick, and lazies go. 
members are responsible for looking after them from a security perspective. There was a time in their lives when they were also responsible for the day and night care, which included the feeding and what have you. So they have that skill set as well. And raise these little things. It's quite heartbreaking. Uh, wow, I love that picture. Eh? It's Felicia. She should have kept her hair like that. <laughs> Look at that smile, though, on that little dude's face. Pretty cool, eh? Yeah. We've already said that, so I'm not going to say it again. Champions of the Earth, we've mentioned that as well. It's hilarious. They went to New York. I didn't even know what was going on. I'm like, whatever. You know, go to New York, la, la, la. And the next thing you know, they're on TV getting this award from the Secretary General of the United Nations. And everybody else is there. It was amazing. So proud. What's going on here? We are the breadwinners. We have respect. We have pride. We have skills. We have dignity. We have um, identity. We are a family, yes, we are a big one family, and we are the breadwinners. Uh, we work uh, there to provide for our families because most of the members have children. I don't have any child, but most of them, they have children, and some of them, they, they are orphans. Uh, they lost their parents. So when they, from the little of the salary that they get, they have to pay for their nannies who look after their children while they are away. So. We have pride on what we are doing. We have skills. Those skills that we, uh, we got on the training, uh, that makes us proud today. And we have dignity. And we have identity. We are a family. It's a cool picture. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Um, down in that picture, there was uh, one of the members who was pregnant. And she didn't take any uh, maternity leave. So she got birth on a way while she was going to the hospital. So there we were at the hospital. We were there to see the child, me and my colleagues there. It's a beautiful picture, huh? Mm. We had a, 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 the real bush baby. <laughs> it was it was on on a night patrol, and then they go back, and uh, I was there. You were there exactly, mm. exactly, and then mm. you must tell the story. The car got the puncture, and uh, she like she had the baby in the bush right there next to the car, with the hyenas and everything. <laughs> you want me to tell? Yes, the story? please. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. I wasn't there. You were there. I was in shock on the telephone. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> uh, on this day. It was me, Tuli Sile, and Klangelan, and Nokrai, the one who's carrying a baby. So we went to the patrol, me and Tuli Sile. I was driving, and Klangelan and Nokrai were left into their house to, uh, the, we were exchanging. So, and Klangelan was pregnant, and she didn't tell us that she was nine months pregnant already. So we went into the patrol. When we come back at 11 o'clock, we find Klangelani sitting into the couch. So when we, we, we were wondering, what are, what are you doing? Why are you, aren't you sleeping? And she said, I have a running stomach. So we just say, well, it's okay. Because we were tired, we went to, to sleep. Uh, at 3 o'clock, uh, Klangelani wake to Lisile because uh, she has a baby. That's why she go and wake her. And she said to Lisile, I'm... I think I'm in labor. So they started uh, to call uh, an ambulance. So because Tulisile can't handle all the situation alone, she came and wake me. Say, goodness, uh, Kangelani, I think she's in labor, but she's saying that she's still seven months pregnant. So I said, how could that happen? And she said, I don't know. That's what she told me. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I started to communicate with the uh, paramedics giving them direction. And Tangelani was busy uh, scratching her bags, telling to Lucilla that I want cold water. We we're running around because Tangelani was not fine at that time. So I called the ambulance and gave them direction. It was very difficult to give the direction uh, to people, those who don't know uh, this place. And Tulisila was busy with Langelan rubbing her back, uh, saying that it's going to be okay. And she said, uh, Tulisila, I think this is witchcraft. It's, I'm not yet uh, nine months. Uh, I'm not yet uh, nine months. So I, dis I think this is witchcraft. I said to Tuli, no, if it is uh, witchcraft, we'll see about that today. 
the, <laughs> there was our supervisor who, who was living uh, close by uh, our house. So I phoned him, say, but we have a problem here. I think Angelani, she's in labor. Uh, that guy, she's very stubborn. But that day, she didn't, he didn't took a... Uh, 30 minutes to come into our compound. So when he came, I told him, I think Langelani uh, is in labor. But she's saying that it's, it's witchcraft. So you have to take him to the hospital because the paramedics will take long to, to come here. So he didn't hesitate. He took the buggy and dragged Langelani into the city. I said to Lucille, you have to go with Barry. I would left here because I don't know anything about childbirth and anything. <laughs> so if anything happens along the way, you will assist him. Barry started driving the vehicle. Along the way, they got a puncture. Then they have to wait. And Langelani was, uh, she didn't wear anything. It was only a, a towel she, was, she, uh, she put on her, her chest. So along the way there, when they got a puncture, uh, Barry started to change the tire. And Changelani said that to Tulisile, I want to pull. Tulisile said, okay, go and pull into the bush there. Immediately she pulled. It was a baby, a baby boy. <laughs> so, and Barry was there looking at all those things that was happening there. And Tulisila was still holding the baby, they didn't know what to do. What am I going to do with this baby? Likely the ambulance came and they cut off the complical cord. It was, so, a, it was a crazy night. Yeah, I'm on the other end of the telephone. <laughs> Buddy is in shock, asking me, what must I do? What must I do? The and they're going to smell the baby and la la la. And the going to come and the car's got a puncture and so on. And you remember the ambulance couldn't come because the road was too bad. So they wanted mm -hmm. to wait. Outside, and we were supposed to meet anyway. What a yeah. shenanigans. <laughs> Guys, thank you, goodness. It was awesome. And, you know, there's a number of, a number of cool stories like that that the Mambas yeah. have gotten. And, and also, in particular, where they rescued people that were being, another woman that was being abducted, that they saw on patrol. I mean, there, there's a number of anecdotal stories. Um, it's a little intimidating to stand here and talk up to this, this bunch of masses, so forgive us for that. What I want to close with. Stacia, if you don't mind, is just to say that, uh, you know, I visit quite a lot of zoos around the world because I, I enjoy it until you go to one of the <coughs> zoos, you know, then you, you just can't wait to get out. But, you know, the value of the work that you guys that are involved with the animals, the value of the work that you do cannot be overstated. Okay, the, it's brought us together. The animals that you have here are representing their cousins and what have you that are running the gauntlet every day in the natural habitat. I'm tempted to say that these are the lucky ones, okay, because they're not walking through snares and dodging bullets every night and getting harassed with spotlights and gamers and falling down just, just used mine shafts and all that sort of thing. The animals themselves, they can't send faxes, they can't play ambassador for their cousins down there. But you guys do, you know, and most of the people that come through my camp have at some stage been to a zoo and have thought, that's it. I'm hooked, you know, and it, it, so I just want to, I just want to say thank you because, you know, the, the animal is the ambassador here for the, the population of its species on the African savanna plains or wherever it might be, you know, it could be uh, orangutans in Borneo or whatever it is, but they don't know that. They need you guys to do that bridging, you know, and the people that come and visit, the people that work here and so on. It's really cool. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a huge privilege. We're done. <laughs> At last. Yeah. Thank you so much. Clicker? Oh, I think, uh, as you can tell, there's lots and lots of stories, and it's so fun to listen to Craig and goodness. Um, so thank you for coming today. This is our final lecture series of the spring session, and we'll be starting again back um, in the fall in August or September, and we'll send out the dates. Um, I will like to remind you that... Uh, all of our lecture series, including this one, will be on our YouTube channel, so you can see this one as well as any of the others we've had so far. So check that out, out. and thank you so much again for coming. Thank you for the Shoemaker family for also supporting this wonderful project as well. We're very appreciative of that. Um, Craig and Goodness will be around today. Um, they're actually headed off to see our rhinos pretty soon, um, and then there is a film festival this week in Kansas City, the International Kansas City Film Festival, and there's actually going to be a documentary featuring the Black Mambas 
on Thursday night at 6.30. That is open to the public. If you're interested in that, please come again. You'll have another chance to hear Craig and Goodness speak and see a documentary. Um, it's a short film, uh, and Randy will be there representing them too as well. Uh, and there'll be a Q&A after that as well. Um, we do have a bird show <laughs> that's starting, so unfortunately we don't have time for questions. Craig and Goodness will be around. We'll have them go up front to the lobby uh, so bird show can start checking um, in their birds for the show. Uh, if you want to ask them a question quickly, that's great. And like I said, they'll be around the rest of the week. Thank you guys so much.